to works. Democratizing 1. the seven. Wa- Let me read it. Outpace the S&P. So have I. Look not at the one brag. on the right. Look at that art. That's art. I like Keith Haring. The, Lowest you know, correlation. Do you know about Basquiat? Do I know about Basquiat? You really don't. Look at this. Look at the guests that we have today, Mike. Are you excited? I am so excited. Are you really well, excited? Of course, every Thursday. I'm right. always excited. All right. But especially for this one. All right. Uh, you guys, this is the, what show is this? 40, what'd we say? 48th. 48th show. So how is it a yeah. week? Oh, it's been a year because we took off a few. We yeah. took off a few, but we're, we're getting close to the one year mark. Yeah. I don't want to see too much more about that. Uh, last week's episode on Friday broke a first day download record. Super you guys are, to. you guys are getting after it. As soon as we dropped the show, you guys are downloading it. So we wanted to say thank you. We appreciate it. And uh, keep it keep it going. And thanks for watching on YouTube. For those that aren't aware, we put the whole show pretty much, right, John? The, almost the whole thing? Yeah, we uh, extended to the whole show now except the cold open. Okay, the YouTube URL is youtube.com slash the compound RWM. And that goes up Friday night. So if you're a visual learner like Michael is and you prefer that to the audio version, we, uh, we, we do a really great – a video version on YouTube. So make sure you're you're subscribed and you're checking that out. What? And only what people watching say? this will know that Michael just got up and left the room while you were doing that. Yeah. I knew I had time. You really didn't have that much time. I, <laughs> I, I, stretched. I stretched. I Well, you know what's nice? So for the first Thursday in like four or five Thursdays, the market is not puking into the close. And, uh, and give, act- give it a minute. No, yeah. well, <laughs> it actually did turn south a little bit. But Carl Kittania tweeted from Bank of America, Participants will be, this is this morning, he said participants will be watching for another post-lunch rally as the S&P 500 has now closed above the mid-session point for four days, which is crazy. It's the longest streak in two months. Of what? Of us going out higher than we Higher started? than lunch. Hmm. That's crazy. It's been it's been two months that we've gone, so four days, yeah, we'll take it. I'm going to be honest. That gotta sounds, start so- That sounds super bearish. No, it doesn't. You got to start somewhere. (laughs) All right. Listen, we have two amazing uh, friends with us today on The Compound and Friends. Really excited for the show. Carlton English is back. Uh, New fan favorite. Carlton covers Wall Street for Barron's. She previously covered hedge funds and other Wall Street. We wrote a really nice thing for you. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to start crying. You just sit there and maybe react to it. (laughs) Okay. Uh, uh, She previously covered hedge funds and other Wall Street stories for The New York Post was a writer at thestreet.com and a producer at CNBC. Prior to getting into journalism, we went very far back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Carlton was a client service associate. Who wrote it? Nicole, is this you? No, Sean wrote it. Sean wrote it? Yeah. Oh, Sean, thank you. Okay. Uh, Carlton first dated Kevin <laughs> Stevenson. <laughs> Uh, you know, my first boyfriend's name was Kevin, not Steven. No, I know. I believe me. I know a lot. Okay. All right. <laughs> I uh, was five, but we okay. We hired a private investigator. We hired a private. <laughs> Sean maybe went a little bit deeper than we needed him to, but that's, I like the dedication. Uh, and Rishi Khanna is here. Rishi, say hello to everyone. Hey, what's up, all? <laughs> okay. Rishi, I'm going to, this time I'm going to address you directly. You are the current CEO of StockTwits. That's correct. Okay. Wait, when you say current, what do you mean? Is this job in jeopardy? <laughs> no. There were three CEOs, stops. I think is what he meant. Yeah. How long have you been the CEO at StockTwits? Uh, right before COVID started. So a little Good timing. Over, almost two and a half years. Okay. And the community exploded during COVID because all of a sudden everyone was trading. Turns out. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, we were already grown and we were already pretty large. But yeah, I mean, we definitely experienced What's what, What's the, how big are we talking? How many users do we have? You know, we're over 6 million users. Whoa. Uh, wow. Hundreds of thousands of daily actives and millions of monthlies. Wow. So yeah. Okay. And you... You, this is not your first gig in the space, of course. You were the managing director at SSNC Technologies, which I know a lot about. Most people have no idea who they are, but they're like yeah. pretty important in finance, right? It's, well, especially in the alternatives world, hedge fund world and money management world, right? So I, I spent most of my career in the hedge fund world. My previous company at SSNC was a company I co-founded called Novus, okay. which was portfolio intelligence for hedge funds and their LPs. And then at SSNC, you know, uh, Bill and Rahul knew me from Novus. And so they brought me in to run a couple of the software departments, their legacy software uh, divisions, where um, essentially doing all the back office software for pretty much all the hedge funds and, okay. and you know, private equity VC Family offices. Now you, now you have a bachelor's in computer science and electrical engineering from Cornell. So do I. I'm, a, I'm an engineer by background, yeah. Okay. How did you find your way to finance first? And then second, how did you find your way to social media finance? So 
the finance thing is interesting. So, you know, I graduated in 99, did my first company. We were actually talking mm-hmm. about this a little bit earlier. Did my first company, which was in music and entertainment, my first startup in college. Um, had two co-founders brought in. You know, this was dot-com yeah. era. But back then, you know, we raised the seed round. Dude, like, 19-year-olds were starting companies then just like they are now. Yeah, right. we, we started this company, raised 500000 in, like, seed money. But, you know, uh, dot-com happened, and we were a little early in our space, as were many in that. Um, so that, you know— shut down and I'm like, okay, like, you know, I'm an engineer and I love, you know, coding and stuff. And so that's where I got into actually the world of finance. It wasn't like a, oh, hey, I want to go finance. So I was trading in college. I, you know, I had my e-trade account and I did okay. Um, but, uh, so I went John, to- John, sp- post his returns on screen, yeah. please. <laughs> I, I uh, went to- uh, Define called- did okay. You got out of Akamai before- uh, uh, I, yeah. <laughs> I went all cash- uh, Did you? Pretty much three months before. Big with Howard, the exception of one- Big Howard Marks Reader at the time? Uh, big Howard Marks Reader <laughs> okay. at the time. But right. uh, with the exception of one position that annoys me still today. Okay, so uh, so st- so stock twits, you, so you're at this point, I think you have like a, a le- we're going to talk about this later. You have like a, le- and so does Carlton- you guys have like a big responsibility because there are a lot of new market participants yep. and they're reading the stuff that you guys are putting out there. Like in your case, I guess they're reading the stuff that your users are putting out there. And in your case, you're writing about these topics and there are people who it's their third year trading. Yeah. And they don't necessarily understand, you know, as much about this as they will someday. Yeah. Um, but like, does that weigh on you at all? Like, I, I hope that people are finding things that are helping them on our platform. Yeah, Please. I tackle it. So you mentioned I started in wealth management and during the financial crisis. And I call it the era of grown men crying because I was a 24, 25-year-old <laughs> associate right. sitting in this office with men who were running companies. And, like, they're crying like, oh, my God, I had to lay off my workers and I had to yeah. all – you know, and you're just, like, seeing this emotional thing where, like, this is wealth management. These are well-off people that were worrying about their health insurance and, you know, these very real things. So yeah. when I made the transition to journalism – I, I realized there is someone reading this. There is a person. It's not a tweet, a headline that's going out into some sort of ether. It's it's a person reading this, like looking either to know what to do or just to make sense of what's happening so that they can inform things. So the one thing I think about a lot in my writing is it's not ne- it's not going to exactly be for everybody. But, you know, some of my readers may be the third year trader, the first year trader, the kid in college, the person retiring. So you just try to bring as much information as possible and, you know, just to kind of help people figure out their way through all of this. It's not going to hit everyone equally, but you just try to realize, like, for some people, it's going to be their 10th time reading a story about this company. For others, it's going to be their first time. Because your, your stuff is in print in Barron's. Mm-hmm. So the people reading that have a lot of money. Yeah. And they worry. Mm-hmm. Like by definition, right? Like if you're reading about finance on a Saturday, you have weighty issues on your mind. You're not right. like a stoner. You're not like somebody that doesn't care. Like you really – okay. So the stuff that you're putting out and you're covering Wall Street, which is even double the responsibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Got it. And like so from your standpoint, I know you're not directly editing the stream. Right. You have a limited amount of control of what users are saying. But – but no, we still, I mean, I, I think about it a lot, right? Especially with the rise of all the new investors. And so, you know, on one hand, we also have our own content, like in the form of our newsletters that yep. we have actually put a lot of work into. You know, we have 1.2 million subscribers to our daily market newsletter. Wow. Um, you know, and, and about 35% open rate. So a lot of people actually open it and read it every day. Who's writing um, that? Uh, well, now it's uh, our good buddy uh, Tom Bruni's come on. Oh, oh man, Bruni's so Bruni's on. He's on. Okay. He's writing. He writes the we daily. Love, we now. love Tom Bruni. Yeah, so uh, he joined us a couple weeks ago. We brought him in full time, um, okay. and so he's leading that. And we're building out our editorial department. Hey, so. time out. We've known Bruni for like ten years, but we he's know only, him from high school. But he's only like twenty five. <laughs> like yeah. not even kidding. That's amazing. <laughs> we could, we know Bruni from I think before he like I think he was in college when we met him. He had to be in college, but it was it's been like he might have been seventeen for real. Like for real, for real. Yeah, Yeah. you know. He was like a market obsessive, I think, that met a bunch of people that we know. Well, dude, I mean, you know, our office is right around the corner. You know that. He'll be in most most days of the week and stuff. All right, well, Um, we'll come by and we'll drop some hyperlinks into Bruni's. uh, (laughs) uh, (laughs) No problem. No problem. You know, the other side, I I think, of education is like the tools and data and stuff. And so, we, you know, we have a lot of room to like deliver more value and educate and stuff. But yeah, the user content itself, right? We got our rules and, you know, you want to make it, but you also don't, 
you know, I have a philosophy against being too big brotherish and too, um, you know, you got to let people find You guys have a tough job of like where to draw the line because there is some shit. Oh, there's some yeah, shit. Right? Uh, and it's, you know, uh, like, you do know, you I, feel, I don't envy like- Do you feel like, like you're the, in competition with some of the other social pl- – like do you – I know it's not Twitter, but maybe yeah. like – maybe – Something that hasn't mattered until two years ago is Reddit. Reddit, but then all of a sudden that became like the center at at least for a little period of time. What's the overlap between Reddit and Slack? Yeah, I was going to ask you. How do you see your job versus what's going on on Reddit? Were you texting with Jay yesterday? Because he asked me the same thing, like literally yesterday. Jay Woods. Yeah, he's like, (laughs) um, what do you think about that? About the overlap? Yeah, so there's def- definitively overlap, right? And what I say about it as an investor is like you go to where you can find information or where you think you can find, you know, edge alpha information mm-hmm. asymmetry. And so Reddit became one of those places, the Wall Street bets, you know, phenomena. Um, so I think there's a good amount of overlap. We haven't done a study to officially say like is it 50%, is it 30%, is it 70%, no idea of that like specificity. But clearly there's an overlap in the communities. It's very different forms of communication, right? Kind of the short form conversational, right. high high velocity, liquid conversations on stock twits versus like some of the longer form stuff. Well, I think people go Reddit, to Reddit. people go to stock twits for financial commentary. Yeah. They might happen or stumble upon the the Wall Street bets section of Reddit. Yeah, right. Yeah, and and that's also the difference is Reddit is you know Reddit, Discord, and Twitter, which are also you know heavily like FinTwitty or, or Wall Street Betty or whatever the terms are we want to use. They are generalist platforms, so there's always going to be, like, they have other, you know, gamers or politics or sports or whatever. For us, you know, our opportunity and that I really, you know, uh, want us to focus on is we can go really deep and verticalize and help, you know, within that site. Like, you can connect your portfolios. We can tell you what's trending. We can share our sentiment data on these things. When are you launching a politics vertical? (laughs) Stop Twitch Uh, for politics? Man, (laughs) I I think we already have that in Twitter. Like, isn't that what Elon Musk is uh, buying? All right, Uh, let's, so let's get into what's going on this week. Uh, um, the week started with J.P. Morgan. Was that Monday? That was Monday. It all that bleeds was together. I know. Yeah, that was Monday, wow. like 6 a.m. All right, Carlton, so you wrote J.P. Morgan's rosy outlook is lifting bank stocks. That was one of the best days for the market of the year um, this year, at least for Thanks, Carlton. S&P Thank and Dow. <laughs> so, not, so well done. What, what, what were they basically saying? It's like, yeah, we see that there are problems, but we're not in a full-blown recession or anything like that yet. Yeah, so there were two things that J.P. Morgan did on this one. Um, one big takeaway was Diamond's statement on, yeah, there's big storm clouds here. And, I mean, we know what they are. Inflation, you know, the geopolitical The stuff that situation. we're all consumed with. Yeah, right. exactly. But he said those may dissipate. They could change, and we're positioned to navigate through that change. You know, it's not to say everything's going to be great, but just hearing someone in that position say, yeah. Yeah. we see what's coming, and we feel confident in being able to handle it. So that, I think, really lifted the broader market. In the case of J.P. Morgan, it was them— lifting um, their guidance on net interest income a bit. It was also them saying that they were going to hit their uh, one of their profitability targets this year. There had been some questions about that. Because the weird thing is, going into this year, J.P. Morgan has been an underperforming bank. It's a well-run bank, you know, the whole fortress balance sheet thing. But they are spending a ton on technology. And investors yeah. were like, all right, what are we doing here? Like, what are you buying? Yeah, how what- much of, on fintech have they, like billions? Billions. In, north of, uh, I think, 10 billion. And- Investors are like, okay, when you're doing that type of spending, are you spending to have something cool? Like I, Mike Mayo, the analyst at Wells Fargo, he's like, are you guys doing Star Wars? Or are we talking about like piping and boring stuff that no one can see and really understand what I, it's Well, for? I think they have to do both. Like yeah. their cybersecurity budget is probably the same size as many countries. Mm-hmm. That, that's not, that's not uh, a luxury. They have no choice, right? So we start with that. Uh, Zell, I feel like is very important to them. It's not just theirs, right. but it's it's got to it's got to require a ton of R and D uh, and maintenance. Yeah, I mean R and D maintenance. When you think about Zell, the payments transfer platform, and how quickly people are able to connect with other people that aren't tied to the same bank, the same institution, and you know the types of checks and balances that have to be there for transactions, it's amazing. Does anybody else do on Wall use Street? Gel, Zell? I do. I use Zell. Yeah. I ran wow. into a tennis instructor needed us to pay him for something. Yeah. Like he had our rackets free strung. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, are you on uh, are you on Venmo? He's like, no. PayPal. I'm like, are you on uh, uh, Cash, Cash App? App? No. What do you want? He's like, Zell. I'm like. The only person I know on Zell is right. my dad. So this, is, this, is, this surprised me. That was, that was JP, weird to me. Yeah. JP Morgan's underperforming XLF, the, the broader financial sector for the last three years. But over the last year, the spread is massive. So XLF is down 5% over the last year. JP Morgan's down 18. That's a lot. It's like a lot, a lot. 
Is is yeah. Jamie Dimon the like the only person on Wall Street that has that level of I I don't want to say credibility but influence. I think he is. Like, I, could I, Moynihan have done that to the market on Monday? Probably not. I, I don't think Moynihan could have done that in the market. DJ? Now, D, DJ? No, I, I don't think he's too far removed from the day-to-day transaction data. I think He'll make you dance, though. But there's no consumers there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Well, now there is, but not, you know what I mean. Not, yeah. not like Chase. Yeah, it's small. Yeah. I think with Moynihan, um, you know, when you looked at the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, remember, Jamie Dimon was recovering from heart surgery then, and Moynihan actually kind of did have to take that role. And he did it well, but... Diamond, I mean, they're just, they're different personalities. Diamond Diamond's, likes being in yeah. front of the camera. He's you first know. team all CEO. What about yeah. uh, James Gorman? James Gorman, I mean, again, he's, he's- so quiet versus Diamond. Well, or no. I, I mean, know. sort of. Okay. I mean, it's, if you're looking at investment banking, no, he's not very quiet at all. If you listen to the okay. analyst calls, he's very brash and stuff. But again, what their business does, it doesn't touch the mom and pop customers so much. You know, I mean, it's wealth management. E-Trade. A little bit. E trade a little much. bit, but that's r- more recent. You know, they haven't, I, I shouldn't say they haven't made their mark there, but you know, they haven't really branded themselves right. there. It's wealth management, investment banking, right? For the mm-hmm. most part. So this is this is interesting. So Jamie said, I'm calling them storm clouds because they're storm clouds. They may anticipate if it was a hurricane, I would tell you that. What, I think he would. What would yeah. the market's reaction have been if he said, it's brace a yourself? <laughs> <laughs> like, a- batten down the hatches. You know, I mean, the thing is, like, if someone's telling you a hurricane's coming and they're saying it's coming in three weeks or what, or, you know, in a few hours, you can prepare. I mean, things are allowed to, you know, markets are allowed to go down. We've seen that. And ah, it doesn't shit, always have to again. be. We're rolling, we're rolling over. over. We're rolling over. <laughs> I, I mean. Still I blame, 40 minutes left. Still okay. 40 minutes. Fingers I blame, crossed. Carlton just gave them permission. So I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I like that. No, finish your thought. But I mean, markets do go down and that doesn't mean that the economy is suffering. It just means we have a market downturn. So there are ways that we can prepare. You make sure balance sheets are secure. If you're a bank, you kind of tighten lending standards and do things to keep yourself safe. And as long as everyone's aware of what's happening, yeah, you can say, yeah, the next month is going to suck, but we all know that. And then month two is going to be better. Ironically, I think one of the safest places to be invested on the equity side, um, if we're going to have a recession is JP Morgan is Bank of America. Mm-hmm. I don't know that they're going to act like consumer staples, right. mm-hmm. but they're going to, I think they're going to act like utilities. Mm-hmm. And when you hear Diamond trumpet how strong their balance sheet is and call himself a, for, a fortress, it's easy to forget that 12 years ago, these bank CEOs, many of them have turned over, but some of them haven't, were fighting tooth and nail against the things that have given them these fortress balance sheets. They didn't want to do level one, two, three uh, mm-hmm. assets. They didn't want to do tier one, tier two capital. They didn't want to be overseen by everyone they're overseen by. But the, the net result of that is we could have a crisis mm-hmm. in the economy that's not necessarily a financial crisis. doesn't mean the stock market will be okay, but I feel like the, the deposit banks will. And it's ironic that yeah. these guys are in such a position of strength right now. Well, but- and the other thing that I thought was interesting about this, you remember the um, current expected credit loss framework that went into effect at the beginning of 2020, which forces banks to kind of post reserves. And on CCAR a- and exactly. all of that stuff. Yeah. And in this last downturn, I mean, yes, we did have Fed stimulus, you know, helping there. So I don't want to undermine that. But the fact that banks constantly have to be looking at their balance sheets and reserving for, you know, those storm clouds, also, they don't like it. It's not fun, but it does keep them safer. Sorry, I interrupted. Well, no, and I mean, on top of that, because you have all these reserves, right? I mean, we're going into like an actual interest rate environment where you can make money on. Mm-hmm. So, right. So the reserves like, aren't, the reserves aren't like just opportunity cost. They actually could become somewhat profitable depending on what the yield curve does. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah at least at least accretive in some way, right? So. We also don't have these big deposit institutions out there with proprietary trading desks running around 30 times uh, leverage in the mm-hmm. same assets that their clients are getting crushed in. Right. And that's another huge difference from, you know, 12 years ago that I think, or 14 years ago, that I think maybe we'll learn to appreciate. I think we we need to now start stress testing the fangs. If we <laughs> if we want to get if we want to get through the current bear market, we might have to get some some idea of what will happen to iPhone sales. Uh, so, all right. But what what else have you heard this week? from Wall Street or what else like should we be aware of? What are you reporting on right now that you think is going to be relevant? Yeah. Um, so what's been going on with retail stocks over the last two weeks, I think you're getting a weird picture of the consumer right now. And I'm still trying to make sense. They of went it. up huge today. Yeah. But I mean, you had Target and, you know, Target losing a quarter of its value last week, but then you have yeah. Macy's up, you know, 17%. You can't or so. figure out the why? 
I mean, some of it I think is the move towards people are going out. They the things that they're buying, they're much more intentional yeah, about back buying. Back to work. Exactly. Back to work. Back to Ann Taylor. Let's go. Let's let's put some airline, yeah. and airlines are saying that demand mm-hmm. has never been higher, that they're seeing acceleration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So people already bought their lawnmowers, like that's done. Home Depot yeah. is done. Right. And now we're buying shit. We're we're doing shit. Yeah, airlines yeah, I, mean, and I think, think are that's well a- above yeah. yeah. pre COVID rent numbers. We'll see if that lasts. This is like two years worth of pent up vacationing. Mm-hmm. We'll but see. That's the thing is I was talking to Ben about this. Everyone who's dying to travel, okay, you go on vacation. It's not like you go on 18 vacations. Right? Uh, well, some people do. <laughs> I, but I'm I mean, it's also business going on travel. Five right? this I mean, year. Yeah. Like business travel is coming back too. Like con- I've been on a conference uh, mm-hmm. stretch. I mean, what's the last event you went to? Uh, last week I was in Palm Beach for permissionless. What is that? Crypto what is that? that doesn't count. That Crypto doesn't count. doesn't count. I think business travel outside of yeah, that business. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, business. Yeah. No, well, I don't, yeah, as a consumer business, we don't have the same kind of no actual you know, business travel. travel I think is going to come to is going to is going to come to a grinding halt pretty soon. Grinding halt. Absolute business travel. Yeah, I do. I'm kind of bearish okay. on that. I think that why because every CEO on every conference call is focused on cash uh, flow. Oh, and, oh and, yeah. and tightening up. And you know what we have that works really well? Google Meet and Zoom. And I'm already hearing it like anecdotally yeah. from people that work in business. And I think it's good. I do gonna, th- right. I think like conferences and trade shows. It's like all of the power is going to be concentrated into like the top three. Let's yeah. say there's not going to be a need to have a lot of the secondary and tertiary events throughout the course of the year. Yeah. Like, you know, who gets hit by that. Like, no, no, I'm not trying to upset anybody in our industry, for example. Yeah. I used to go to all these like FPA events, financial okay. planners mm-hmm. association yeah. of blank. And they were great. Like I met great people. I enjoyed all of it. So I would go to the financial planners association of Tennessee. Right. And then I would go to the one of central Tennessee and it's like, wait, what? Right. Why? <laughs> or or lower Kansas City. Yeah. Oh, when is the upper Kansas City? Oh, that's next month. Right. There are a lot of events that really don't need to be in person or don't need to take place at all. They were an ex- they were an excuse for dues. Hey, we're paying these dues. Right. Yeah. You know wh- why are we paying this? Oh, we're gonna have our jamboree. You're gonna lose some of that stuff. I think you lose some of it, but don't but you think big events are gonna get, get bigger? Out. Yeah. The big events will get bigger. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, just even in the not not real world of blockchain, right? Like, I mean, so permissionless this year, first one that they put on, 7,000 people. It was originally supposed wow. to be like 3,000. Wow. That's crazy. I was talking to the founders. I'm friends with them. They're like, next year, they're expecting it to be eighteen to 22,000 people. Tell me where the price of uh, Bitcoin is. I'll tell you whether or not. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? All, all, like, all kidding aside, yeah. I emceed. I emceed. Uh, what's the, the, the one they do with the Marriott Marquis? The crypto one. Consensus? Consensus. Oh, it's in Austin. Literally, I, I spent three hours. I don't know why I did this. I I mean, it was fine. I emceed Consensus in 2019. Okay. Okay? I swear to God, there were 20 people in the audience. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it was in 2020, uh, 2021. I yeah. bet it was much well, bigger. Well, it's coming up June 9th. It's, uh, it's It'll in be Austin. Huge this year. It's 10 to 12. Abigail Johnson's okay. speaking there. I yeah. promise you, really? mm-hmm. there were 20 people there. Yeah. And you know who was oh, on no, stage? I, Novogratz, mm-hmm. Meltem, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, the, like like the 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 crowd, yeah, the, the crowd. crypto crowd. Well, I guess Abigail must be going because of the four hundred one k Bitcoin thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. But I'm saying that will ebb and flow based on the asset class, like anything else. Hundred percent, like everything else. Because um, I was at gold mining conferences in 2011, <laughs> and I'm sure they weren't as packed as the ones in 20. Uh, I'm sure yeah. they were more packed than the ones in 2015. I, I would I would assume so. Right? They might so. be back. I don't know. Um, tell me about the state of retail trading. What What is going on? Uh, I mean, people are pulling, you know, I mean, in the mm-hmm. markets that we've had over the last, what, five months, um, retail pulls back, right? I mean, like it's are they it pulling? Scary. Are they still there but doing different stuff or are they like not transacting yeah, as like, frequently as are they, they were? Are they going to Staples or do they not trade that? No, they do not trade. Like they're, uh, you know, there's a good percentage, right? All the new, like that massive rise of new investors, mm-hmm. right? That went into the Robin Hoods and the, you know, uh, Coinbase's and stuff, whatever the asset class is. You see a lot of them just, you know, hey, they're going to step away from the markets. And, and we I believe see that this- asset class that you're referring to is garbage. 
you know, fair. <laughs> I, you know, it's still an asset class that people invest in, and Coinbase has like seventy nine million accounts. Large, large, uh, large, large cap garbage, stocks. small garbage. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, so Mid cap memes. <laughs> so you know, you see it, you see it regardless, uh, and and you know, we see it in our you know user base too, and whatnot. Is there's just a pullback? There's like, hey, it's not you know everything doesn't go up every day anymore. So right, I'm going to take a break. I can watch sports. I can watch. You know, I can. Go to the they find, they'll find new – some of them will find new hobbies and some of them will stick around long enough to actually educate themselves. Right, and then people learn and like, hey, it's a good introduction, right? And that's my that's my take is <laughs> – It's a good introduction. <laughs> These people have been – nah. people have been nuked. You know, sometimes you got to, you got to, you know, eat a little dirt to learn. Tough uh, love, kid. Uh, they got, all right, so they got jumped into the gang. Yeah. I would argue they got a 10-year education <laughs> in, in, in 12 months. That's I what I would right. say. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. great. If they were paying attention. I would say you just saw – the most ebullient, psychotically exuberant market of yeah. all time. And immediately after, I mean, it always is this way, but like immediately after you have just li literally seen like 3,000 stocks lose 80% of their value. Yeah. Like those two things all happen within 12 months. John, throw that chart back up. Yeah. Pretty, I mean, 12 to 18 months. We right? got some good numbers here from Goldman Sachs. $72 billion of S&P 500 single stocks was bought by retail investors from January 2019 yeah. through February 2022. $72 billion. That's nuts. They also estimate that around 50% of retail positions in NASDAQ 100 single stocks accumulated since January 2019 have been sold. Wow. Is $72 billion really nuts, though, for that time period? That's a lot of money. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Listen, five hundred I mean, million dollars. Like, I don't know. Seventy billion. I feel like it is because it's like three hundred dollar trades, right? Yeah, that's these are small why trades. it's a lot no, of no, money. These are like these not are, even three hundred dollars. Odd, they're, literally they're odd. Ten dollar mm -hmm. trades. Right, so Fifty dollar trades. So, Rishi, I wonder if you could corroborate these numbers, or you know, you don't have to disclose exactly. But so, all right, Robinhood disclosed yeah. that their monthly active users dropped ten percent. John, we have this one. Uh, Year over year from Q1, you know, to, which yeah. actually that's like sounds not that bad. Oh, no, this is quarter over quarter. But still, that's way better than than uh, Coinbase, which trading volume was seven was one hundred seventy seven uh, billion dollars yeah. in Q4. One hundred seventy seven billion dollars in Mike, Q4. Mike, pause. So we're saying what is this? This, this is Robin. Robin. This is monthly active, users. monthly active users. OK, but their transaction volume fell like 50. So plus. Q1 yeah. 2020 yeah. is eight point six. Million? Million. Okay. Yeah. The peak is Q2 2021, 21.3 million. Yep. So this is Robinhood. Now it's down to 16 million. So we're still double mm -hmm. where we were before the pandemic started. Yeah. On balance, they have still had massive growth, even if you pull out the peak of the meme stock mania. Yeah, absolutely. What's now, where does the 16 go? That's the Well, Q2, Q2 is, uh, that, that could get cut in half. I wouldn't be shocked. That go back, round I don't track. know that it gets like again. This is we're looking at monthly active users, which is somewhat indicative. But if you have a portfolio, you're going to open and check it. Yeah, right. Yeah. If you look at transaction volume, trade, it's way right. worse. If you look way at worse. transaction value, so which is where that, they make the money. Let's look at that for Coinbase. Good point. Yeah, Good point. let's look at that for Coinbase. So, retail trading volume at Coinbase last quarter in Q4 was 177 billion dollars. It fell 58 percent. Yeah. Quarter over quarter. What is that amount of trades? Wow. Uh, no, yeah, trading just volume. Trading. Yeah, like actual, not trades. checking your account, mm -hmm. not users, volume. 177 billion down to 74 from Q4 to Q1. That's yeah. unbelievable. Massive. Brutal. Yeah. Now imagine you were hiring well, as though those Q4 numbers were going to be the Imagine, <laughs> yeah. imagine they, yeah. they actually did. Yeah. They tripled and, and, their headcount. Well. And, and I mean, listen, that's the right number for them to look at because that's what they generate revenue on. But that is a dollar value. What I'd also be interested in is to see the actual transaction numbers because remember the dollar value is affected by the price of the asset. So Bitcoin's cut by fifty yeah. percent. So True. hey, if the transact, if it's let's say you how many that trades, by two, not how much was the cumulative yeah. dollar amount yeah. of the right. trade. Right. Yeah, but, they're get, but they're not but, getting paid per transaction. They're getting paid on the dollar amount. So that's why this is the right thing to look at from yeah. a revenue and a business model perspective. But from a retail interest and impact perspective, I think you do have to look at just the raw transaction. So if volumes. Bitcoin were to rebound, then you. Well, they'll be yeah. back. Yeah. They'll come back. Look at this chart from Yuri and Timmer, who was on the show a couple of weeks. Looking at the call, to, this is interesting. Looking at the call to put ratio. Usually you see the inverse. People look at the put call yeah. ratio to see fear in the market. Now we're looking at the opposite. It's how many calls bought for every put. And yeah. naturally it's on the floor. Nobody's excited. Wait, the blue, <laughs> the blue line is the call to put? Yeah. And and uh, if you're buying calls now, you're, it's, it's, it's like, uh, it's like lot, lottery tickets. <laughs> I mean, it could work. 
it could work. But so you've got this segment of the market, like the the super high active traders. You see people. One more chart, souring on sectors. This is it's unusual to see sector ETFs have such big outflows. I think this is probably XLK. If I had to guess, I can't imagine what else this is. You're seeing the biggest monthly outflow ever, and this is primarily dominated by like the spider ETFs. You yeah. know, um, what is that? Negative twenty. Yeah, like negative eight twenty. It's just it's just. It negative doesn't, twenty billion dollars. It, it doesn't happen that often. So you've got this oh, whole wow. segment of the market that's active, that's trading, and then all the way on the other side, the people that actually like dominate the you know the the this is not trading, but the the dollars coming in are the people that just never pull out. Um, look at uh, there was an article in the journal talking about target date funds. Yeah, and. The least sensitive to zero, yeah, like point nine percent, zero point nine percent. That was yeah. that was at Vanguard. You say, oh well, it's Vanguard. People like it's Vanguard. They're indoctrinated. It's the same thing at Tiro Price. Mm -hmm. Once you're in a target date fund, you don't f around. Yeah, and where yeah. where is your target date fund? Wait, they zero point like nine IRA what? Your four hundred one k, right? Like, I mean, you're not really zero point yeah, nine percent of that. savers touch their account in target date fund made account. trades. During Less than account. one percent of target date fund holders at Vanguard. I mean, how often do you look at your 401k or something? Never. Like, at, I don't yeah. even, like... Uh, Hourly. Literally never. <laughs> so, then, it's a source of my confidence. And so a lot of people, like, waiting for retail capitulation. I just... It just might not be in the cards. Bank of America, uh, last week, during which the S&P 500... During which, I feel like that's a Shakespearean. The S&P <laughs> fell another 3%. Bank of America security clients were net buyers of U.S. equities for the sixth consecutive week. But they're buying individual stocks now instead of ETFs. Flows are still, people are still coming in. You, you posted uh, or you gave us some trending stuff from StockTwits, uh, what's been going on this week. Let's go through these. You could explain these things to me because I am. I, I don't even know all the Sega? companies. <laughs> I am very unplugged these days. So there's a ticker symbol, S-I-G-A. Yeah. Which is a smallpox drug or vaccine maker. Yeah, yeah. That popped on monkey, monkey pox. pox. Classic monkeypox oh trade, by the way. <laughs> I mean, everyone had to know that. Move. Everybody had to go right back to the well. We're the best. Is, uh, like all, like the royal, all of us. Like the fact that we do shit like this. Like <laughs> stocks are popping on monkeypox. Monkey pox. I mean, you know, stocks were popping on COVID back. Uh, Remember the yeah. Ebola, the Ebola suits. Yeah. Yeah. Like the suits, wait. No. Or was that COVID suits? There was like hazmat suits. Rishi, how do yeah. people how do people find the ticker and all coalesce around it as the monkeypox stock? You must see that take place. How yeah. does that work? Well, so, I mean, uh, you know, there's always a group of people that are following the, the stock, right? And so mm -hmm. then they start like, hey, something's happening. They start, you know. You should hear about the stock that right, I know they, about. They start talking about mm -hmm. it and stuff. And so for us, like, hey, it starts trending because more they're bringing more and more people into it, maybe their community or however they've formed around that stock. There's some stocks I discover. I'm like, wow, this stock is like five yeah, remember followers. This, remember this? Amidst, this is February 2020. Amidst coronavirus panic, the stock of this hazmat suit maker is up 88%. I don't remember what stock? Was that one, Lakeland? Was that what it was called? Oh, was that that one? Okay. Oh, uh, Lakeland. Yeah, Lakeland. Yeah, I, yeah. I remember now. Remember that? I do remember 88%. that, yeah. 88%. And- uh, I, I wonder where it is now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, they coalesce and then it starts so trending. When a, when, a, when a ticker is trending yeah. on StockTwits platform, yeah. you guys will surface it in a list of trending tickers. Yeah. You won't say anything about it. You'll let people discover it. Yeah, then they can drill in and see what the conversation is about. So they can click it. the ticker that's trending and yeah. be like, why is this trending? Yeah. I've never heard of SIGA. Exactly. Okay, do you I have monkeypox? Anyone? Uh, Anyone in the room? By the way, you've been I'm traveling still through what Lakeland. monkeypox is. Here's Lakeland, 47 down to 15. I mean, naturally. Buy it. But yeah. where was it before? Uh, Buy it for monkeypox. That's true. Duncan, right. do you have a monkeypox like, take? I was having this conversation yesterday. Should, we worry, about, should we worry about this? Well, I mean, it, it looks pretty it's, bad, the people that have it. But that's not what I want to hear. But I mean, the transmission seems really low. They're so saying I sex. To, well, no, I, I heard that it, like you barely have the viral load to infect one other person. When you're when you're sick with monkeypox, something like that. You Whereas barely COVID, have the, okay. COVID is like it feels ten, very judgy. ten yeah. times or something. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about the viral load complex. I carry. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm not going to worry about that one. Uh, juxtaposition of the luxury market: Nordstrom and Toll Brothers versus discounters, Target, Walmart. What's going on there? Well, I mean, you saw. I mean, we know what's going on. You know, tall, Target, Walmart. Though, Toll Brothers had good things to say. Yeah, they had uh, they had good things to say. I think. Again, for the short, I mean, what happens when mortgage rates hit eight percent, nine percent? You know, but they're I, saying I, they had almost no cancellations, and they're the yeah. high end of the market. They're, and that's where, like, the point, like, and so those guys were up, and there was a lot of positive sentiment on that, and Nordstrom as well. Whereas we saw what happened to Target and Walmart. Okay, and, so uh, we can say that inflation does not affect everybody equally. Yeah, and some people absolutely it's a big enough burden that it will change their habits. Yeah, and some people can just coast right through it. That's like one of those aspects of economics that. Uh, you could understand why 
there's a portion of this country that's just like, F- you all. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, great. You made inflation happen again. Like, this is literally going to upend <laughs> yeah. my life. Inflation, gas, you know, prices, you know, things like that. There's- yeah, I mean, when you look at what's happened to gas prices, it's one of those things that maybe last year people didn't really think about their weekly run to the pump. Yeah. And now it's like, all right, well, we're not, you know, doing the takeout dinner this week because an extra 20 bucks or whatever is going into my gas tank. You saw what they said today? No, what did they say today? They said uh, gasoline demand just hit a new low back to 2013, X the pandemic. Really? Pull out 2020, yeah. So is it kind of that high prices are the cure for high yeah. prices sort prices of thing? Prices are averaging over $6 a a, a gallon in California, $5.5 yeah. dollars nat. We found the- we found the we gas found price, the yeah. price that makes people stop yeah. driving. It's five and a half dollars. Well, yeah, and nationally. I mean, when you're over six dollars, I mean, depending on where you live, a public transportation ticket, whether it's subway or a regional rail, depending where you are, I mean, you start doing that math. Right. So a wealthy household, the amount to fill up their gas tank might be less than one percent of their monthly mm-hmm. expenditure. Right. Um, a a bottom a bottom decile household, it could be like half heat their home or air condition their home mm-hmm. and their gas. That could be half the money they spend. So we apparently reached some number where demand gets destroyed. Uh, GameStop was back this week. Why? It's, we it, have to do this every year. There's going to be a GameStop rally. I, I think, yeah. I mean, I was, I asked the same question uh, today as well. So uh, it's, All right, what's it's, the latest bullshit? <laughs> it, it is not clear to me why. I think, you know, people just- What did GameStop uh, do this week? It's up- uh, Did you see it's, it's up, up a lot. Yeah, 30? it went from like a hundred to hundred forty or something. Yeah. Like a, it's like ninety five to one twenty five. It went. It was. It was. It opened up yesterday at like eighty eight bucks, and it popped to one fifty today. Because why not? Yeah, it's still as big of a short. It's morning. still a big short position in there that the stock could still do that. I. I mean, really? What are they doing? NFT? Well, that's <laughs> yeah. Where uh, you know, a lot of people were talking about. Hey, is this a you know just short unwind? Is you know because it's just has it to just be keeps mm-hmm. has to. I mean, has to be. I am no longer that smart with GameStop and AMC. I, I don't quite understand. RDBX um, is a SPAC darling. Oh, shorts reloaded a little bit. I mean, this is a crazy chart. Holy moly. Remember, there was this whole thing that there were more shares sold short than were outstanding. Yeah. Because they were being, you know. Yeah. So obviously they got wiped out. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Like they went to zero, the shorts, and uh, they reloaded. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Who's, yeah. Uh, who's, got the, who's got the guts to reload a short on that? that that's, Not Melvin. <laughs> so they w- did you cover that they wound down I, I wasn't covering that no okay it was a matter of time though yeah okay it's very rare that you can keep things going well it's just can, can we can we have a conversation like it, so you know the fees on those assets were still like you could run a perfectly fine business right you just can't get over the high water marks so, like, you know there's the whole two percent on 10 billion or whatever was left how much was left eight yeah, billion like, uh, eight billion mm-hmm. right it'd be fine I, I like I could run a company with that, um, but, but, but these guys they had the keep, higher water marks and yeah they can't yeah. keep your top talent on two percent. Right. Uh, yeah, but you know, the top, there, there's the I don't know the, talent. That the question is, the w- w- <laughs> like on one hand, hey, it's brave to say that and do that. On the other hand, it's like, is that wait, what's lazy? brave? What's brave? You know, because if you're a pension fund invest in this, like, are you going to give your guy this money again the next time around if he's just going to cop out and, you know, once uh, he's down 50% and not willing to try to work back from that? I think Plotkin made $800 million last year. Yeah, I mean, I get it. Sense. But that's before yeah. taxes. Yeah, and, <laughs> you know, that's, I get it. You do? <laughs> like, like, I don't know. That's like two really Hamptons houses for him. I don't know. but um, I don't really get it. That sounds amazing. That's amazing to me. Right, but my, my point there wasn't that, hey, he made a lot of money. Like, these guys, like, a lot of great hedge fund managers make a lot of money or successful hedge fund managers make a lot of money and they, they still have doubt. Like, you think Chase Coleman's going to shut down like after this that Car- bad a year? Like Carlton, he's going to shut down did, the hedge fund? Did anybody ever in in your time covering the hedge fund industry, did anyone ever propose the idea of we would love to pay you a 20% performance fee, but we want to do it on a 36 month, not a 12 month? Has it never occurred to anybody? Yeah. I, I've never encountered that. I mean, I know people were starting to get creative on what performance fees should look yeah. like, but yeah, 36 months just seems. I like, I will gladly pay you a performance fee, mm-hmm. just not on a calendar year. Yeah. Because yeah. in any year, anything can happen. Over three years, if you do really well, you're probably not a schmuck. So but I'm sure yeah, a lot of them are benchmarked. One year, you're lucky. I was at, yeah. no, they're not, hedge funds are not typically benchmarked. Benchmarked. I mean, benchmarked. Well, so, benchmarked. So, 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 like so, 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 profits are paid not above and beyond what the S&P did. That's nice. No. So mm-hmm. I, for a long time, like our first clients were LPs and 
when I started discovering this, like, mm-hmm. it's essentially a liquidity imbalance in how you get paid and, you know, how you're at. And, like, and I was like, like this payment structure is amazing if you're a hedge fund. <laughs> it's um, amazing if you're the payee. But it yeah. makes no sense, especially if, you know, sometimes, like, there's also lockup mismatches mm-hmm. and stuff, too. So you're still paying the performance fee, but you're, you're not, you don't have redemption rights and stuff. So uh, I had a lot of, you know, a lot of creative ideas I was trying to do 10 years ago. This was 10, 12 years ago. And, you know, everyone just was kind of okay with how it is. It hasn't changed at all. No. So let's talk about what they're doing. Literally. We've got the we've got some data from Goldman again, showing that hedge funds uh, rotated. But this is interesting. They rotated sharply away from growth. Um, look at these flows that we're looking at that's up here. That's the least shocking thing you could have said. <laughs> they rotated away from the thing that's under liquidation. Yeah, that's down eighty percent. Well, it's a little bit surprising. I'll get to that in a second. But here we've got another chart just showing stocks with sales with enterprise value to sales ratios. Next, I'm sorry, go back, please. Stocks with enterprise value to sales ratios above ten times. So we really did get pretty close to two thousand. It looked like we had around twenty five percent of the market, mm-hmm. and that has. Yeah. Since corrected very, wait, very quickly. Twenty five percent of the stock market was companies that were trading ten times enterprise value to sales. EV that to got sales. that got up to thirty five in the dot com bubble. Right. So that that so excess we were got, almost there. That excess got cleaned up really quick. But the reason why I'm a little bit surprised not surprised, but this just this part is interesting. So hedge fund favorites have got an absolutely Annihilated. I was looking yeah. through the list of their top fifty. Like uh, they they own the hedge like, fund VIPs. I think they own like nine percent of VIP they own like nine percent of Uber. They own twenty five percent of of Zillow. Like some of these blown up names. But here's the interesting part. Look at the fifty stocks that most frequently appear among the largest ten holders of hedge funds. It's almost comedy. The top five. So again, what we're looking at is the fifty stocks that most frequently appear among the largest ten yeah. holders of hedge mm-hmm. funds. The top five, literally. Fang. Yeah. Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Apple. Are you f-ing kidding me? That's worth two and twenty. But I mean, <laughs> like literally. If you're a larger hedge fund, you almost don't have a choice. I mean, if you're managing several billion dollars, you have to have a place to put it. Your universe of stocks. Is yeah, tiny. It, it's because. But I mean, I yeah. hear you, but here's the thing: it's a high class problem. Or- well, hell yeah. But here's the thing: it also shows the average portfolio weight when the stock ranks among the top ten. It's high. It's yeah. like seven, eight, seven, six. <laughs> well, so they're yeah. like market weight. No, so yeah. look at they it this set way. the market. If you're a $30 right? We know like it's active managers that are yeah. setting the market. It's not the indexes. If, it's, if yeah. you're a thirty billion dollar hedge fund, what are the positions you can trade in where you're not going to move more than twenty percent of the daily volume in order to get into those positions in any mm-hmm. meaningful size to drive any meaningful returns? Yep. Right? Now There's they don't, not- but they buy the stocks, not the queues, because. It would be hard to bill people on ETF positions. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, and, and depending on how they more, might have hedging strategies, so right? So f- more hilarious to me is four new energy stocks entered the basket. So four new stocks entered the, the VIP list. What is it? Uh, Chevron? En- uh, Chesapeake. What's VAL? Oxid- Valero. Valero. Oh, yeah. Valero. Occidental and LNG, Ch- uh, Chenier. So like, so... Uh, the sector now is a 10% weight. So it's performance chasing just like everybody else. Like ev- this it's is high class, every, high class. everybody plays. It's sophisticated performance it's chasing. It's an extremely yeah. sophisticated version of performance chasing. Uh, I'm shocked to see Chesapeake back in the group. I mean, that company- I haven't heard that in a while. Post, yeah. Post-bankruptcy, yeah. right? Yeah. It was cleaned up. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> at least the, the balance sheet was cleaned up, I should say. We were looking, Josh and I were looking at this today. So Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, and Tesla. The stocks got so much bigger from the, where they were pre-pandemic to today. So I was sharing a chart. I, the drawdowns in, from yeah. those six stocks, mm-hmm. percentage-wise, was around 27 28% in COVID. Okay. Today, it's around 30%. So basically the same, percentage-wise. Yeah. It's a $3.5 trillion market cap drawdown versus $1.5 trillion back then. That's how much they've grown. So the stock the prices have come down the same amount, but the dollar amount is triple. Mm-hmm. So yeah, right? so the mark the S and P is I think twenty percent or so above pre pandemic highs. These stocks are still like forty percent above. Yeah, and I'm using mm-hmm. market cap, and they've been buying back shares, so it's probably yeah. even more than that. Yep. So I think that like where these stocks go, that's where the market will go. Can I ask you a question? Like, how valid do we feel? like the S and P five hundred? Right? Why do, why do we pay? I know why we pay attention to it, but when is JC getting that bullshit in your brain? Yeah. Stop no, I haven't talked to him. I haven't okay. talked to him. Right. Uh, why the S and P five hundred? I don't know because it's the S and P five hundred. All right, go ahead. No, I get what you're saying, but like, what, like, 
it shouldn't it be like the S&P 5 and then the S&P 495 or something? Like, oh, so what you're saying, yeah. What I'm saying is like, you just really need to watch those five stocks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think there's They're like very ten, important. There's like 10 stocks that effectively decide the, the, the uh, direction of the index. Right. But within the index, there could be huge dispersion. And yeah. energy is a really good example of that. Like it literally spent 10 years shrinking in terms of its size in the index, so much it so- It went from one to five, by the way, recently. Right, so yeah. much so that it went up 40% and is still under 5% of the index. Of the index, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's and interesting though is that like the, the these five big names, five, six, whatever, are like 40% of the Qs. But I think prior to this, it was very difficult to foresee yeah. these names being in a 30% drawdown, basically all of them, not Apple. At the same but, time. With the S and P 500 outperforming so much, so mm -hmm. the S and P was down 18 while the Nasdaq was down 30. Yeah, you would have been like, well, what else would keep the S and P up? Yeah, energy. Okay, well, no, it actually did. Yeah, well, it got, right, you had enough healthcare stocks and consumer staples that were big enough, and energy that were big enough to like keep us from being down 40. percent Yeah, on the yeah, and I guess maybe I'm more like the Qs are probably the more uh, exposed, right, on on this one. Russell values barely like the Sam, Russell large cap values barely down. It sounds like Sam Rowe would answer your question by saying, "Why are we even calling it the S and P 500? Uh, Amazon is like 20 companies. Yeah, <laughs> Alphabet is like 50 companies. Yeah, yeah, so it's almost more like the S and P 700. We just have a lot of businesses consolidated under a few tickers. under a single ticker, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, did you see the Schwab Modern Wealth Survey? I did. What'd you think about? What'd you what, What'd you think overall? Before we get into some of the specifics, I thought this was really interesting. The way the way they phrased the questions. Um, what'd you think? So I definitely was wondering what was going on with um, that whole thing on the average net worth to make someone feel well, happy yeah. and feel healthy, oh. and that it's actually decreased. Oh. And I'm just wondering if there's like just this kind of change in. If you're not going to work that much, there's certain things you don't need to do. I know we were talking about gas prices a few minutes ago, but a lot of people aren't commuting five days a week like they used to. A lot of people aren't wearing suits and going to the dry cleaners yeah. as often, you know, all of that stuff. So I think people in some ways are finding that they can get by with less, but I almost never expected to see the number go down. The number of the average net worth of people or the number that they think is high net worth? The number that they think is high net worth. The number that they think that they need to be happy. Like that went down... Like 30%. What's the number that they said they need to be happy? Wait, this is shocking. Needed for right here. Uh, so 1.75 in 2020, and now it's 1.1. Wait, what is the meaning of this? I've never, this is so. I've never seen anything like it before. Right. So, I mean, is this yeah. telling us something wait, like, let's tell, hey, so we wait. appreciate life more? Are we enlightened? Are we enlightened? Hold I don't on. think so. I don't think we so. Are not, <laughs> let's, we are not. Let's tell, the, let's tell the listeners who aren't seeing this what we're talking about. So Schwab talked to a thousand people. Uh, survey was conducted by Logical Research February 1st to February 16th among a national sample in, of 1,000 Americans. In ages, 2021. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is important. In February of 21, um, age 21 to 75 years old. And they tried to like balance the sample among demographic variables, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, so what they're saying here is that in order to be wealthy in 2020 – Americans said you need two point six million dollars, and in twenty twenty one they said actually one point nine million would be okay. Uh, needed for financial happiness, you only need one point seven five million, and in twenty twenty one they said nope, actually more like one point one million. What is the meaning of this? I think it's exactly what we just said. They're not they're not doing as much in twenty twenty one. This year it might be different. Yeah, I think it's because it costs money to work. It you know? really does. Yeah. yeah. To eat two meals a day out of the house is a big difference, especially in New York. Yeah. And also, I mean, you just think of the hassle things. You know, you come home from work. Do you want to cook? Maybe right. not. Are you hiring a babysitter? The things that we pay for out of convenience because you're working, you know, 50, 60 hours a week out of commute onto it. That could be 70, 80. But now you can do those things yourself. Maybe you're not paying to have your laundry done because you're you're working from right. home some days. You can do it yourself. Maybe Commuting you're I do a lot week. less dry cleaning. No more yeah. dry cleaning. I was Ooh, about to say a lot that. Less. I apologize every time I go to my dry cleaners. Sorry, like during the I pandemic, I like I was looking for things in my apartment. Like, do I need a jacket that needs like a button sewn on it? Like, I felt so bad. But I hope my wine store person says thank you. So it's a true story. I did. Uh, I did TV from New Jersey this week. Mm -hmm. Went to CNBC. Oh yeah. So we're, that's back now. 
So I'm going once a week. You just started going right now? I just started going two weeks ago. No way. Okay. Yeah. So they're having like one or two of us on set out of five. Okay. It's great. It's great. I love seeing everybody. It's, it's cool. But they destroy my shirts. <laughs> ma- we do makeup. makeup. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I went back to the dry cleaner with a white shirt with the inside of the collar looked like Donald Trump <laughs> used the shirt uh, as, like a, as like a face cloth, okay? So it's, it's literally circus peanut orange. Yep. The whole inside. Of the- I guess what happens is I guess you sweat and, and makeup runs. Okay, fine. So this guy's like, you're back. My dry, <laughs> cleaner, my dry cleaner. Because he remembers three years ago. Me bringing in shirts in where he'd be like, dude, you should throw this out. <laughs> like, you, I'll, you could pay me to clean this, but right, forget. But really just throw it away. And actually, uh, Jim Cramer told me his trick was he just goes to TJ Maxx, buys a package of shirts. He never expects to be able to wear them twice. Yeah. So anyway, really? I'm the uh, idiot that I am. I custom made shirts at Brooks Brothers and then I wipe them with orange paint and then I end up having to throw them out. It, so. That stuff does not but come out. The, so the dry cleaners are like – like a dry cleaning bill, not that it's a big bill, but it's very representative of people not needing as much money anymore because mm-hmm. they're like doing the same thing. D- did Americans just become simpler in 2020, 2021? Like just in terms of – I think we became simpler. I, like, you know, definitely not enlightened or anything. Yeah. I'm not enlightened. Like, simpler. I've yeah. always been a basic bitch. Yeah, I think so. I just, I just, need, definitely. To, I just need my tequila. Yeah. I really don't – I don't need that much. Yeah. Right. I, I 100% think so, right? I just need a boat. And you don't need to show, like, you're not meeting up with people. So you're not, you know, kind of keeping up with the Joneses, so to say, and, and showing off in this and that. I'm not yeah. satisfied with your answer about uh, we're, we're eating less outside food. So our need for financial happiness went down to 60% or 40% or whatever it is. So there's more I'm to not, it? Yeah, or? I'm not sure what it is, but. Okay. Uh, this is like a big deal, I think. After the pandemic, the best describes my attitude about my lifestyle. We'll go back to living and spending the same as before COVID-19, 47%. We'll live a quieter life and save more money than before COVID-19, 29%. Wait, we'll say that one more time. Say that one more time. We'll live a quieter life and save more money than before, yeah. 29%. I really do think that this Hold is- Hold on. Yeah. We'll make up for lost time and splurge 70, more- 70%. No, 24%. Oh, that's it? How does your that's math That's the that smallest- <laughs> Yeah, no, we said 47. I I, no, no, no. I didn't know that this was adding up to 100%. I thought each was its own individual question. When I say percent, oh, I see. All right, okay. gotcha. Don't give me that Fair. percent. You're talking Fair. Dow points. You're talking points, okay? <laughs> I think that there's before COVID and after COVID. It was such a watershed moment for everyone. And a lot of people are like really, truly reevaluating. Are we after what's COVID What's important? Yet? Like, where are we? We're so after COVID. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay. I think so. Uh, when was that? When was that line? For me, well, it's vaccine. the day I got it. When we got the vaccine. No, the day, day I got, got COVID. It. I finally got it in December. Everybody's COVID mm-hmm. ended. When the you got day COVID. they not the day they got it, the day they got over getting yeah. it, and then all of a sudden, no big deal. Actually, For when you got people, it, I, I avoided I it. Gotten it yet. <laughs> Any minute. I know. I'm like, you know who's getting it right now? The people that avoided it. Yes, I've been hearing that a lot. Thank oh. God. Thank God. They're not being rushed to the hospital. Yeah. Right. We're a little bit smarter about how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's lessened in intensity too. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Not, yeah. Don't don't it's listen to my ripping science through takes. New York again. It is. it is. I mean, the numbers are my definitely daughter's there. class. There was like five cases. I know. Week. I know a hundred people that have gotten in the last two weeks. Yeah, it's nuts. They're it was not, like Omicron, like mm-hmm. December. But they're not like calling everybody they know. They're yeah. just like sitting at home. Does your construction yeah. worker have it? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. Uh, maybe. maybe. All right. So you know what's a joke? Like people say it to ignore the noise. Like, give me a f- break. It's 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 so loud. It's incredibly noisy. Jason Gepfer from Sentiment Trader has this kick-ass chart showing uh, the daily number of news articles mentioning bear market. And I'm guilty of this. They're spiking, obviously, right? Yeah. Like, that's yeah. just what we do. I feel personally attacked right now. <laughs> you, guys did, you guys did your first bear market cover la- not this past week or was this past week? I don't, no, I don't think it was this past week. I think it was two, two weeks, weeks ago. Yeah. But you had the claw. We did, yeah. It's not just – so it's not just – the bear jumping over the bull on a skateboard, mm-hmm. not the cartoons. It was a bear claw oh, wow. ripping. The no, it part was of the, like ripping through yeah, the page. It yeah. was. You guys yeah, like strict. really did that, it, yeah. did it. Yeah. I was so bullish. So so you can't <laughs> you can't ignore the noise. But we found the bottom. <laughs> there is like it. literally. We were just talking about this. There's no reason to open your 401k account ever, right? You know it's bad. Yeah. yeah. What are we looking at? What are we trying to accomplish? All right. Daily number of news articles mentioning bear market. We just hit. did this. No, but hold on. It hit 4,000 and it looks like yeah, daily, yeah. daily, daily, daily. I wish 4, we could 4,000 convi- articles a day. It would have been nice to have that back to like 08 to yeah. see what it's like kind of relative. Oh yeah, that's a good point. 
Um, who do, who did the big bear market feature for you guys? Who wrote it? I should know this off the top of my head, and I don't. So we'll don't just... worry, we'll not edit this out. Yeah. <laughs> was it Randall Forsyth? No, I don't think it was Randall. Was okay. it Jack? He has his column. Jack Howe? I don't Ooh. think. No, he has his Streetwise column. Mm. Okay. What What's the cover this was weekend? Was it Santoli? I want to share with us? <laughs> He's no longer there. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if I can share. I mean, no, you can't. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> you literally can't. I can't. I okay. mean, I I know what it is, but okay. I I don't think I can share. Oh, it you right know what? Should coming not up? share it. You yeah, that's exciting. Please don't. Please don't do yeah. that. Uh, it's gonna be a good one though. He, he's gonna drop it right on stock. Yeah, first. I know. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be a good one. I never. I never miss an issue. And can I do a plug? I want you to. Okay, so we have our weekly Barons Roundtable TV show. Okay, I'll, and, I'll be there. What what night? Uh, it's actually mornings now, so Saturday morning at 10 a.m. and 11:30 a.m. on Fox Business. But um, we will have a segment where we're discussing the cover. Oh, that's with cool. The editors on it. Okay, but I, I watch you. I watch you guys. I love it because oh, uh, Jack Otter is great, and you're obviously you're great. Thank you. Um, who's who else is on it? Uh, ben Levison, so he is our markets editor, yep. and then oh. Jack Howe, who does Streetwise. So two gr- two great reporters and great writers. Um, and Jack's, Jack's a great editor and you do your thing phenomenally. Thank you. Okay. You, you seem to have a lot of fun with them. No, it's the you guys are like a crew. We are. And the shame of it is we're still taping from home. That should change soon. But, um, it was so funny cause I joined Barron's in January of 2020. The show I think oh, had wow. been for like two months beforehand. So I was just getting to know the guys. I didn't know them. And just as we're like eight weeks into taping yeah. together and you're finally like, okay, I got this rapport. I'm yeah, a little yeah. bit used to this TV thing. Lockdown happened, so then we had to learn how to do TV from home. And I mean, you know this definitely. It's a this. totally yeah. different skill set where you can't interject and yeah. you can't be free talking because you can't always see the person the same way, or there's a delay. And that's the worst part of having a co- having somebody in the cast with you on a show, and you're not with them. Mm-hmm. You kind of don't know when they're about to finish talking. Yeah, which leads to awkward pauses in between. Uh, it, yeah. And, or you'll start talking and they're not or done. interruptions, yeah. yeah. And the delays just, the delays with guests just murder the whole vibe. And there's also just, when you have a natural in-person rapport, um, you can throw a quick aside comment where you're not breaking up somebody's train of thought, but it's just quickly adds, and you can't do that when you're in boxes because then you actually are interrupting the You person. know the other thing I can't do? I can't physically intimidate a guest anymore either. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't like, I can't like, oh, like almost like lean closer to them while they're talking or any of that stuff. So that doesn't, this whole format doesn't work well for me. Carlton, I wanted yeah, to for, ask for you <laughs> about this. This this company's new to me, but they've raised a ton of money, I, like hundreds of millions of dollars, I think. Uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal called mm-hmm. the Airbnb of Wall Street. Are you, do you know about this? I, I did see the article. Yeah, I'm still trying to wrap my head around okay. it. To be honest, yes. <laughs> so. do, do you like? Do you guys understand what? The, like, I'm trying to wrap my head around the what this is doing. So let's. So yeah. I really don't know what it is. So let, let, let's read this. Okay. So here's. I think this is the lead. In the same way, Airbnb turned uh, vacant homes into vacation rentals. Capitolis is turning the unused capital of investing giants like BlackRock into assets that banks can use to facilitate all kinds of transactions. So the first reaction is like- like Flash loan? The first reaction is like, wait a minute. Is this, what's, what? Remember what we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation where we said, hey, like banks are more like fortressed up. And now we're going the other way. Now I feel like, hey, this has started to be like, all right, because you guys have to have all these capital reserves, let's mess with that. Let's tap that We want to democratize. Structured swap kind of way or something. Here it is. You you have the capital, yeah, right? So like, the new idea resembles an old one. You're not supposed to use it. Banks <laughs> exactly. have long banks have long sliced up and sold their big corporate loans to other banks and investors. Capitalists figured out how to use the syndication concept to turn all kinds of banking products, foreign exchange swaps, and lines of credit, to name a few, into a kind of fixed income fixed income security or loan they can sell to investors. I don't know that we need this. Hold on, yeah, hold I, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The firm has raised some yeah, how much sixty billion from investors for the banks to use in the past two years and reduced trillions of dollars in trading positions. But wait, the $60 billion is not in, it's not investments into the company. It's just- Right, from the- yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so everyone's in this. Sequoia, Andreessen Horowitz, SVB, State Street, Citi, JP Morgan, Spark, Andreessen Horowitz. Um, what is, Carlton, what are, they, what are they talking about? How does this work? I, what is it? What does well, that see, mean? See, this is the stuff that makes me nervous because when you go through these things and I actually am trying to draw a map of, okay, Where's okay? I understand the capital that sits on the bank sheet. You hear the yeah. CEOs every earnings call saying, "We could have done this, but damn Unlock regulations it. make it. us do." Right. You know, I that part I understand. It, I understand it's, it's there and it should tr- be used. Four trillion in total reserves held by U.S. depository institutions. So here's what it is: they say, yeah. for example, 
Citigroup, who's an investor, mm-hmm. Citigroup owns a basket of equities tied to its clients' trades. Okay, right. Mm-hmm. right. Capitolis using investor money essentially mirrors those trades, entering into a derivative contract to take the risk off the bank's balance sheet. Oh boy. Yeah. Citigroup is now freed up to do more trading and the investors get a fixed payout. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm not, saying this baby gonna, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is going to cause a financial crisis, <laughs> <laughs> but just in case, you might as well just file for unemployment right one. now yeah, if you're again, listening to this. Because when you're trying to just map out, I mean, and I do this exercise, you know, where you're like, okay, yeah. here's where the money is. Here's where it went. Here's where it went. We're mirroring things. And suddenly I have a web and I don't know who owns what and this what we This sounds very 080. It sounds yeah. very 080. Yeah. yeah. It, it's an, it's an insurance product, and but it's not insurance. Right. Remember that? Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> On capital <laughs> reserves, I feel like those three words should not typically go together. That's all. That's all. That's yeah, all that's I, I yeah. feel like there should just be kind of like this um, grab bag of like financial terminology, and it's just going to be the next product where it's you know like MBS derivative, and it's just like every few years someone just kind of picks three, and yeah. they're like, yeah, let's just. This is like. AIG has entered the chat. <laughs> did, so, did somebody say derivatives tied to total reserves at U.S. depository institutions? <laughs> Sign us up. I don't up. know about this. Come on. What are uh, you doing? This, for, well, the guy, the guy, Gil Mandelzis, he looks like a badass. Gil Mandelzis was a bar owner in Israel. See, what are you guys worried about? <laughs> and a banker before launching another Wall Street startup he eventually. So I don't know what you guys are worried about. Uh, this this all sounds like something that we need, especially on Main Street. Like Main Street is clamoring for a way for large U.S. depository uh, uh, institutions to unlock money that's supposed to be set aside for safekeeping. All I have to yeah. ask is when so does Wells Fargo get fined? <laughs> <laughs> when does city when does city blow up? Um, does anybody think it's dope that the Wall Street Journal included pictures of him playing tennis? I, I was going to say something about that. What? I mean, yeah. Hold I feel on. like that's we the have, picture John, you want this? of you in the Wall Street Journal. On screen. All right. You got it on screen? I got it here. Oh, Carlton. Carlton printed, printed it out. I know. I'm it. like the did oldest millennial. At, did you do this at Kinko's? Like, right. did, yeah, it's not tennis. That's racquetball. Is he wearing No, tim- it's tennis. It's indoor. Oh, is he wearing Timberlands? <laughs> I can't see the. What color of shoes are those? Those look like orange, like orange. sneakers. But he's gone like, you know, one-handed backhand looks like. No, zoom into the tennis picture. It's incredible. I mean, just just give him the money. I don't even know why. We're <laughs> well, and his partner is Tom uh, Glosser, right? He was the former CEO of uh, Thompson Reuters. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can't wait. For, can't wait for the bailout. Forget everything I said. That sounds great. <laughs> uh, you know what? That'll come public. It'll be like the the biggest deal of the year in 2024 or whatever. Well, it'll be spac. It, it'll spac. We'll spac it up. <laughs> spac it up. Uh, Redbox was a recent spac that you that you said was trending on your Red platform. Redbox, yeah. the video. Why? Thing, right. Why? What's going on? I mean, they, they had some good numbers. But the like, stock's up 125% who, who this week. Are the, like, I just want to know who that's the people that's still- That's America. RDBX. That's America. Like, DVDs in the- who Dude, does that's that America. Yeah. Serious, I'm, I'm not even f***ing a DVD player. Dude, people and walk- And it's at every 7-Eleven. People walk into Walmart and buy yeah. a Taylor Swift CD. No. Today. They there do. There are more vinyl sales than our CD sales. But I'm just saying, <laughs> the, there are things that are still going on I know, that are unimaginable. It blows my mind. That's why when I saw that, I was like, how is this trending? Well, that how sounds very they- elitist, but that like, truly, that's what a lot of America is. People have stockbrokers. Like I, I've, no, I, mean- I heard a story about somebody <laughs> whose broker pitched them a stock the other day. I thought it was a joke. Somebody did say yesterday to me, they're like, yeah, I called up my broker, da, 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 da. And I was like, wait, you, you're calling your broker? Yeah, did you call an 800 number? No, I called my guy. His name is John. So John calls you and does stock trades for you? I heard that four times in the last two weeks too from friends, which I never hear from. Okay, so so things are still going on that are unimaginable in this world. Um, All right, we're gonna do new new home sales. This is via Ed Yordani. We don't have to spend a lot of time on this. I think this is the definition of stagflation. During April, new home sales, this is registered when contracts are signed, dropped 16.6% month over month. And the month's supply of new homes jumped to nine from 6.9 in March. I think at the low, we were at two months worth of inventory. So now we're back up to nine. Um, That was Monday. Today, we heard about pending home sales, which is basically after contract, but before close. Mm -hmm. So this is like a very accurate read on the existing homes. Uh, 90% of the home sales market is existing, right? So that captures a lot. Yep. we basically saw a fall off the cliff down 3.9% from last month to April, from March to April. 
Wow. So this is all mortgage rates. We, yeah. we have this yeah. chart. Wait, why is this, this stagflation? Because prices are still high. Prices are still high. Transactions yeah. are yeah. falling. Transactions are falling off a cliff, but prices remain stubbornly high. That's the definition of stagflation to me. Mm -hmm. But something has to give. Prices can't stay high no. if the buyers uh, melt away to this extent month after yeah, month. Yeah, so stagflation is not a week. It's got to stay here, right? You can't say something's yeah, stagflation for three days. I think we've been in stagflation for, the last for a three few days? months. Yeah. No, for a few months. I think the one difference here is, though, I mean, you know, houses are like, you know, they're not like a liquid asset that you're buying all the time unless you're, you know, Black Rock or whatever. Home prices are not going to crash. Um, you know, I don't think they're going to crash. They might pull back. I mean, there's yeah. definitely a supply demand sure. issue. Because sure. the other side, like with housing is, hey, we know we have need more houses. Mm -hmm. And so you see that dip in the chart, like after the mortgage crisis, uh, you know, 12 years ago. So we didn't build a lot of houses. And so like, that's why we're having our supply demand. Like The National you know, Association right of now, Realtors right? Chief Economist Lawrence Yoon says 9% uh, uh, decline in prices is what they expect. Yeah, and that sounds that doesn't right. seem that sounds unreasonable. This is, this yeah. is one of the worst charts ever. This right. is home buyer mortgage payments. This is 2020. This is 2021. Yeah. This is 2022. Up 43%. This is killing people. I mean, a year ago, you could have gotten a year to point. date. It's, How could prices not fall? How? Home prices? Right. It takes time. Like, for no, they, they can. They're not going to crash. They could fall 5%, 10% sure. I, I think they have. They have to. to. Yeah. yeah. I th in because some markets, they can crash more than that. I mean, come down more than that. Yeah. I yeah. say like, for instance, yeah. does anybody no, actually want to live in Boise or was that just like a fever dream from the pandemic where yeah. prices were – no, mm -hmm. I'm not even dissing Boise, Idaho. I'm yeah. saying markets like that that went up 100 percent in price. Right, yeah. Does anybody really still want to be there once but the he, pandemic's But the over? problem is it's going to be it's going to be new sales yeah. because sellers would have moved already. They would have already hit the bid. Right, yeah. and so they're going to be less motivated to sell. Yeah. Buyers still have to buy because it's demographics. So I think it'll put like a, a higher floor under prices. But you just made it so that a mortgage is so expensive know, that it materially changes yeah. how much you could afford to pay. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And by the way, mortgages are not going to get cheaper anytime soon. So I think that's the other thing, right? I mean, like we're at what five point three, five point five. Financial crisis, they will. No, well, <laughs> like you know, well, what I mean though is in the next, you know, as the rates keep going yeah. up, like we'll hit six, seven, eight. We did just have well, whoa, 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 five is low historically. What did you just say? Right, like five is very low historically. What did you just say? How how high are they going to go? Six, seven, eight percent is not unreasonable. You think so for a mortgage? Absolutely. Wow, eight percent you'll crash out. My parents' mortgage in the eighties was like eleven. No, it's not the eighties anymore. I get, I know, I know, I know. Like 2.3% is not normal. Eight, no. 8% eight, yeah. eight, no. 8 you'll crash yeah. the mortgage market everywhere except So we house. actually just got the, the yeah. we actually just got the biggest drop in mortgage rates since April 2020. This week. I think it was went from five it went down to five one. I don't know where it was. Was five it five, and a quarter. five? Five, five and a quarter. <laughs> Dude, eight percent okay. mortgage rates will do some serious damage. Six, six to eight, six to eight. That's okay. my window. Uh, revise, it yeah. revise it lower. Revise it lower. Revise it lower. Try to sell. Try to sell beforehand. Because what I say on this <laughs> podcast is going to move markets. Totally. <laughs> um, NFTs. Why is it getting dumber? Uh, dumber. Listen, go off. Go off, Queen. Go off. <laughs> Wait, were we? Yeah. We were talking about stepping. Yeah, we were talking about stepping. Why is it getting dumber? Who says it's got dumber? It's so dumb. No, no. no, no. Well, yeah. the, the story stupidity that we're talking about. a while ago. What's the dumbest part now? Well, okay. So you had this actor, Seth Green, right? Oh, Who great. had this whole yeah. NFT that he was going to build a show about. And I guess in, what he's saying is in a phishing scam, he lost the NFT. So because- So no show. No show. What? <laughs> Which in, I think we you made this point maybe, but it's like this whole kind of crypto- you know, de decentralized finance generation. Oh, it's great. You know, we can all interact with each other, blah, blah, blah. I, but like when the shit hits the fan, like I like having a person I can call right. and yell at and say, fix this. And it might take a while, but it gets fixed. Give me back my ape. Yeah, yeah no, so I mean, ape. like my serious <laughs> commentary his ape on anymore. anymore. I know. It's not. Right. to the show. I know. It's, it's not hilarious. stolen. It's hilarious. He was tricked. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's not illegal. Yeah. Well, and the, the code is the law. <laughs> well, but like this is yeah. the serious, and this is the point you're making too, and the serious conversation around like whether it's NFTs or, or, or crypto and stuff is, you know, in the early adopter crowd, you know, which I'm, I have a lot of friends and I'm, you know, mm -hmm. very familiar with it. All billionaires. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of like, hey, decentralization, self custodied wallets. I'm like, that's like putting your money under a mattress. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And like, we have banks for a reason because if I screw shit up, I there's can call the bank yeah. and, and the bank, there's recourse through government and contract law and stuff like that, whatever it might be, right? Um, you don't really have that. So that's why, I mean, listen, I think there's a lot of really interesting things around the technology mm -hmm. and underlying protocols and stuff like that. 
but expecting people to put like, you know, lots of money and life savings mm-hmm. and stuff. And they have to remember these 12 to 24 words and not lose that piece Dude, of paper. Do you remember the, like, remember the movie Heat? Remember the movie Heat? I love that movie. Okay. The Rush? So, so what they're trying to do is steal bearer bonds. That's mm-hmm. that big gunfight yeah. in the street is about. Yeah. Long the as bearer bond, ever whoever has the piece of paper and hands it in gets paid yeah, gets on paid. the spot. Because yeah. it doesn't matter, right? Because it, it's not registered in anybody's name. That was same with Die Hard 1. By but way. stealing a bearer bond yep. is still illegal. Yeah. In this f-ing world, <laughs> we finally invented a type of investment where if somebody steals it, <laughs> it actually becomes their property and not yours. So long as the blockchain records that they mm-hmm. now own yeah. it. That's insane to me that people think that's an improvement on the current yeah. financial system. And you can improve you, on that. I mean, my, it, do you see my point? In fairness, yeah. in fairness. Yeah, I'm looking at, at, at heat quotes. So yeah, just. Not, not. <laughs> <laughs> Love that movie. Uh, but like, so don't, so don't dabble in decentralization if then you're going to go and cry and say you need an authority figure to sort things out. Pick right. a lane. Pick a lane. No, mm-hmm. I, and I agree with that, right? And there's, that's where I think there are interesting opportunities just from a technology and protocol perspective. Like there are things that can be enabled better in our current financial system. You know, we're, we're built on, you know, decades and decades and mm-hmm. layers and layers. There's cruft in there. There's CNBC op- did a segment this morning with people who had their virtual land stolen. I oh yeah. I was, I, I, I was w- making breakfast while I watched it. I thought I was smoking crack. I, I their mean, virtual no, no, in land. one of my groups, like a friend of a friend of their mine. Their virtual had, land was stolen. Like metaverse land? A friend they of a friend had two million stolen yesterday. Two million dollars worth, worth of virtual of, land? Yeah, yesterday. I almost feel like I don't want to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't I don't want to say that. But I thought I, I thought it was hallucinating. It was it was a very sophisticated social phishing scam. phishing scam. So this girl's like mm-hmm. a personal trainer girl. This woman is a personal trainer. And she wanted to own property in the virtual, maybe Decentraland or something. Yeah. Next adjacent to Snoop Dogg, like- which I don't. Okay. All right. I understand, like in real ge- geographical terms, how one thing is next to another. In virtual terms, mm-hmm. I don't understand why somebody just can't say, "Oh no, this isn't actually next to it. It's we put this now." But fine. Yeah. All right. I understand. So she clicked on the wrong link and lost it, and it was like worth millions of dollars. And yeah. she's like, "This is crazy." I'm like, "No, you're crazy." Because look what you just did. But apparently I'm crazy for thinking that she's Josh, crazy. Josh, Josh, Josh. Don't let yourself get attached to anything you are not willing to walk out on in 30 seconds flat. Okay. <laughs> well, Robert De Niro. well done. I got to rewatch that movie. Robert De Niro said to Val Kilmer. Yeah. Okay. I, I used to own that DVD. Did you uh, Did you see about Adam Newman's new crypto project? Oh, my God. Carbon no, I have flow, oh, carbon. Actually, flow, flow carbon. Flow I didn't carbon. hate it. I read about it. Yeah. It made sense to me. He brought in $32 million from uh, VCs, including that, Andreessen Horowitz. But so that has They're a right. utility, though, that project. That yeah, it's makes carbon sense credits. to me. It's carbon credits. He brought in $32 million in equity and $38 million in a token sale. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems like but I'm going to wait rhetoric. a little bit longer before it's I give him that kind of Somebody yeah. had a great line, like, what are the odds that he's a thief two times? <laughs> <laughs> But the tokens represent no actual carbon credits credit. that people do need to trade. Right. Corporations yeah. Fair. need to transact. Right. And maybe this is a better way to transact than through lawyers. And there are a number of, you know, kind of climate uh, change, uh, you know, token projects out there and stuff that are around, you know, doing things around this space. So I get it. I, this is more of a person credibility thing right oh, now. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm on episode five of We Crashed and it's. Freaking fascinating. He uh, doesn't need any money from us. And well, right. we, don't, we don't want to give him any. So Wait till you get to the right. IPO part. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost there. Yeah. yeah. I oh, wa- <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it's you a good watch it. You watched it too? Oh, I had to. I haven't seen I it. I did yet. not watch it. Heard it's good. Everyone says it's great. Yeah, no, yeah. it's great. And I mean, I think the weird thing is, you know, we, we're all very familiar with what happened. I covered it a bit. And when you're watching it, having that knowledge, and then you're like, I wonder what it's like for people who kind of were aware of it right? and are yeah. seeing this stuff for the first time. Right. I was only vaguely aware of it until they filed their S1. Mm-hmm. And then I did like- Blew up. I did a lot Ooh. of content on it. Yeah. I, like I wrote about it a lot. Yeah. I was tweeting about it. And- You had a great, sorry, go on. But you No, had a great, tell, tell me, you were about to compliment me. <laughs> yeah. No, I remember you had a great point as the IPO was falling apart. You did a video where you're like, never forget that Wall Street was trying to sell this to you. For 47 oof. billion. Yeah. Oof, oof, oof. And yeah. they they had to have – they knew. That went a little viral. A yeah. week before the whole mm-hmm. thing unraveled, Yeah, I don't want to say it's Morgan Stanley. It could be J.P. Morgan. Whoever was the lead, they priced this IPO with a valuation of $47 billion, Yeah, 
which by 2021 sounds terms light. actually sounds, sounds cute. tame. That sounds yeah. cute. <laughs> if this were 21, that might have been a $100 billion IPO. I don't oh, know. Yeah. You know what it was? had revenue. It was not a fake company. You know right? what blew yeah. it up? You know what blew it up in, in their S1? The Elevate the World's Consciousness sent red flags r- all over the country, all over the yeah. universe. Yeah. And two, it's like, wait, what is this bullshit? Mm-hmm. And there was some excessive, like, you know, the private jet stories. Excessive corporate governance. Him selling, the, him selling weed to him, the company. Yeah. Right. No. Buying him, buildings. No, he like, would buy a building. Out, and rent it back mm-hmm. to the company. And then have the company lease it from him. Since he's yeah. front running the real estate. I mean, I mean, <laughs> like, whoa. why not? I yeah. guess. So like, if he wasn't doing all of that shit, it probably would have come public. But then there was this parallel track of like the personal stories. Yeah. Right. Which I think Business Insider probably was all over those. Where mm-hmm. it's like, Wait, what do you mean? There's like a bong on the plane. Isn't he going public? Yeah. Like, not that I'm opposed to weed, but like now? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think there was a plane that was like kind of filthy and trashed afterwards. He had like a crew okay. yeah. that they would just go on like vacations. Mm-hmm. Um, what if I told you I think that stock's going to make a comeback? And I think it's the perfect real estate play for the post pandemic reopening of corporate whatever. I would buy that thesis. I mean, I don't know where the stock is at or the company's okay. like yeah. financial It's a $4 stuff, stock, and they report in – they have a new seven. CEO. It's ripping. What's his name, the CEO? Steve Ballmer. Dude, this guy's legit. I think he was like a – I think he was like a real estate professional. How new is oh, this Oh, the guy from CEO? General Growth, right? Lock me Mathrani. W-E is the ticker. I'm not pitching uh, – listeners, please don't buy the stock. I'm begging you. Um – I looked at their last earnings report mm-hmm. and they beat on like every metric. They're still losing money. Yeah. This guy has cleaned up the balance sheet by like half. I think he's gotten rid of half their debt, yeah. their long term leases. I think there's like a real turnaround story. Uh, you know, Carlton, like it's I'm five just, billion just throwing dollar it out there. Right now. <laughs> you, could, you could cover it if you want. I, I don't own it. I, I, have no position. I have no position. Look, I mean, to your point, though, I mean, it it was a business. It just wasn't a business that deserved a $47 billion yeah. value. I mean, it's realistic. That's right. You know? So they're still losing a ton of money, but less than they were supposed to. Mm-hmm. And we're paying them, right? Mm-hmm. We, have, we have people in WeWorks. I'm I don't sure. know if we still do. But um, we must. We must. We must. Well, I mean, like, here's, here's another question for you, like, just along this line. Like, the Ubers and the WeWorks, right? Like, these businesses that... Their big pitch was always, hey, we're going to be able to make money at scale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When is Uber big enough? They're still losing, what, $400 they made million? Dollars they quarter? made money. Like, I mean, you know, and I haven't looked at, like, their latest, like, last quarter or whatever. They but, had a like, profitable fourth quarter, and they'll they probably okay. have another profitable fourth quarter this year. But okay. so what? So, I mean, the when did the company there, like, start? So, okay, great. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and Uber had to have a lot cleaned up, too, right? Yeah. To get there. But, like, at some point, you know— Scan, they, like what is like? Does everyone in the world have to use it? Is that the only? Yeah, point they you can make, make money? more money doing food delivery. Yeah, Uber Eats is like than the rides business. Yeah, yo, I look think. at the oh, look at this. This is Uber. Last quarter lost six billion. They yeah. made money for two quarters. Yeah, out of the twenty quarters they've been yeah. public, they, it looks like they lost money. Yeah, what's operating cash them? flow over the last like you know it's, eight it's, quarters? It's a, you like, had your shot. You had your shot. You had a decade to, to Listen, turn. I'm mm-hmm. I'm a fan of Uber as a product. They're pitching now. They're pitching Uber Freight is going to be the next. The next hot thing. Oh yeah, where, Buffett, Buffett's going to buy them. No, where they're looking at the inefficiencies in the trucking, trucking market, is. and but there's a couple of those long haul railroad, and they're like, we're probably going to be better at this than the company that was founded in 1890. Yeah, probably. in fairness, yeah. they have yeah. like they have the strong data, and it's like, yeah. just or, or it's just going to cost us 10 billion, but we're going to be really good at it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so another five and years we'll of losses. And we'll make eight back. I promise. Another five years of losses, but we're going to yeah, so that's we're not gonna, happening. We're going to dominate. That that part is over. Uh, could be. All right. We are going to do favorites and let you guys get out of here. No. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. But we're going to all come back and do this very soon. Um, podcasts, business breakdowns. Have you ever heard an episode of business breakdowns? I'm not. No. I have no? not. No. You are going to love this. Okay. Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Oh, Colossus okay. Media. Yeah. He, I guess he hired, I got to ask him about this. They have a team. They have a team. A whole squad. So he's not doing every episode now. He doesn't do business breakdowns. Did he do this one? No. He has a guy that used to work at Goldman Sachs interview Mark Rubenstein. Uh, Matt Russell. He's the CEO, by the way. Okay. Uh, okay. He's great. Yeah, he's I never great. even heard of this yeah. kid. He's great. Business breakdowns is every episode, they look at a big famous company and they break down how does this company make money? Where did it oh, come that's from? Good. That's, that's good. awesome. Yeah, they've done a lot of that. So the last episode was Goldman Sachs. Mm-hmm. They look at the 150-year history of Goldman Sachs. Yeah. And Mark Rubenstein is the guest. He's like my favorite writer about financial services. Yeah. Uh, Substack. 
Um, he's got a Beatles accent too, right? He's got like the Beatles he's got accent. got like a Liverpudlian yeah. uh, <laughs> British accent. Yeah. And he knows Goldman Sachs inside and out. Okay. He's so great. It's a one hour episode. Okay. You will love it. Is it a new Perfect. podcast or is it no. been around a while? It's, it's been, been around, around probably a, a year, year or two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, who else have they done? What are the other business breakdowns? Twitter, Shopify, Exxon. I mean, they've done they've done like a lot. Anyway, it's public companies. It's, yeah. All public companies. Uh, no, they did Stripe, I think, but yeah. it, mostly public. They're great. It's, it's great. An, what they do is they find the right person yeah. for yeah. the episode who can really like go deep on. It's a not a generalist. Yeah. It's good. It's good. So the the Goldman Sachs thing was cool, and Rubenstein gets into like the cyclicality of the CEO. And he's like, in one era, it's Lloyd, Lloyd Blankfein who comes yeah. from trading. Mm -hmm. The prior era, it was somebody who came from the banking side. But are they always bald? They're always bald. This is a, a pre wrap You can't have that much stress and keep your hair. Yeah. You can't I be the CEO yeah. of Goldman and have a full head of hair. I don't believe so. It's impossible. <laughs> Jamie Dimon has a nice head of hair. Because uh, he deals with consumers. Yeah. <laughs> because he does blood rituals. Come on, keep up. Yeah. We know this. Yeah, has to. All right. Uh, the what, other one. What real the hell is this? Uh, remember Brandy? I like literally just oh, singer. Yeah. I watched this last night. I love Swear her. Swear to God. I love her now. All right. Brandy was a best-selling, like- 98? Huge. Mm -hmm. Late 90s yeah. R&B singer. Like number one hits. Yeah. Huge. Um, the Boy Is Mine. Yeah, yeah. that's big. That's yeah. big. Yeah. Her brother is Ray J, yeah. which we know what he's famous for. And then she kind of like, I don't want to say she disappeared, but like her, that was her moment and it's not her moment anymore. So Jack Harlow is like a, a 14 year old rapper <laughs> and they asked him a question about Ray J. Like, did you know that that's Brandy's brother? Well, they were, they were doing that thing where he had to listen to a song and name who the artist is. So it was on hot and they were giving him clues. And it's like Ray J's you know, they, sister. They were giving him a culture test basically. Yeah, pretty much. And he failed. Cause he didn't know who Brandy was. Who the hell is Jack Harlow? No, I he knew who like, Brandy he was. was. He didn't know that Ray J he's was. He's like, Brandy. The, he's like a white Drake. Basically. I don't even What's know what poppin'? Drake is. Brand new Stop just it. popped in. I got options. So he has a new album out now, but he's got like he's got like a couple of big hit songs, but he's very young and he like kind of dropped 20s. the ball. Like they he should have yeah. known. I feel like he should have known. He should have known that yeah. Brandy and Ray J are related. No, I don't even think he knew who Brandy was. It's bad. It did. was bad. He's I mean, six I watched the three. Thing last now night. he's a child. He's yeah. six foot three. He's a child. He was like he was three months when that, like when the, he he was born, wasn't even. He was born yeah. in 98. Yeah. No, I'm yeah. saying, I'm giving him a pass on age. Yeah. On age. I get it. Yeah. Right? But the but, better part is what Brandy did then. So Brandy, like, took his, he is, he, I think he's the number one song in the country right now. It's called yeah. First Class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's okay. She basically hijacked his beat and, like, barred him into the Stone Age. Like, her, she rapped, yeah. she rapped over his beat and made his song, like, five times hotter. Than it was, wow. and she's not even a rapper. And I'm like, wait, yeah. when did Brandy become a rapper? It was Holy amazing. Yeah, and by think... the way, she clowned him on Twitter first before she even did. She's like, I'm gonna drop bar at you 43. To... I'm gonna drop. I know bars. you're not a rap guy, but like, this is this is worth. It was listening. amazing. I was oh, just I very as a 90s kid. Yeah, so I was like, yeah, you tell, you tell this, you tell this. This is how kid it was done. This is how we did it. If you get out barred by an R&B singer from the 90s, I that, feel like you have to retire I, <laughs> at 14. Is that how old he is? No, he's, no like he's like 24. 24. He's okay. a kid, though. Yeah. But I feel like he has to go. Uh, he's going to live with this forever. It was amazing. It was amazing. I don't know if it's going to be that detrimental. He's probably going to like tweet it out and be like, yeah. this is so cool. Uh, what else can you do? Yeah, anyway, it, it I thought was that was so hot. cool. All right, Michael, favorites. Um, I watched what I, wa I watched uh, the George Carlin documentary. You do watch no, it yet? No spoilers. Yet. Okay. okay. Holy moly. Wait, that did was, you watch Carlin document? Yeah, yeah. it's two parter. Oh, wow. It, 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 Is it HBO? HBO it's or Appet Netflix? Appetite did it, HBO. It was okay. so incredibly well done. Like mm -hmm. one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. Yeah. And also, obviously, 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 like holy shit, what a life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and a ton about him I didn't know. In his earlier years, I he was literally unrecognizable and all the different variations of his career and the end got a little bit very, very, very dark. Um, and then it's funny. I was thinking like, oh, he's kind of like Tim Dillon. And then as I read the New York Post article, they mentioned uh, that he's, he's like my – So he's my favorite comic ever. And I understand mm -hmm. that like Pryor has the crown um, or maybe Dangerfield it's or a, it's Eddie a, it's, Murphy. It's subjective. He could be your favorite. I really yeah. think it's Carlin is the one. And I always think about – like I always think about when shit happens, what would Carlin yeah. think about this? Yeah. So they Trump yeah, in particular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And COVID, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would just, I yeah. think the world missed out on Carlin's take. On COVID, he would have said, he would have said, thank God. The, yeah. the earth is shaking you people off finally. He hated people. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
He loved people individually. individually yeah. So, so yeah, he said, he that was a big, that was a big yeah. part that he loved people, but he hated groups of people. Mm-hmm. I can't believe he died in two thousand eight. I can't believe it's been so long. I can't so believe it's long, been so right? long. It, so if you watch some of Carlin's older stuff, like early 80s during the Reagan administration, I mean, there were parts of his bits that you could have just ripped out and put into 2016, yes. so 20. They like, did I that. mean, it was bizarre. They, they did that they on the did? doc. Yeah. Okay. And it was, it was, it oh, gave wow. you chills because it's like, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. He was telling stories about like how he was raised on like the Lower East Side of Manhattan or something mm-hmm. in like the 1920s or 30s. He's talking about like, he's like, here's why you're sick all the time. Hand sanitizers, yep. bottled water. <laughs> yeah. He's like, we were tempered in shit. We literally were swimming in sewage, and it was good for us. <laughs> uh, he he was really he was anyway. Really he the was best. he was truly like one of a kind. I'm gonna I gotta watch. You're it gonna this love weekend. it. Yeah, 100%. yeah. No, I didn't know about it. that. Carlton, have you brought us a favorite today? Well, I mean, I've been on the Broadway kick, as you guys pointed out. So okay. um, I saw Moulin Rouge twice. I mm. saw um, For Color Girls on uh, Tuesday night. I saw Macbeth. I say see everything. Why? So is this like a, a new thing for you or have you always been really into theater? I've always been into theater. Um, it was kind of funny. So being a journalist, I'll do a quick minute of real talk. You start out, you don't make a lot of money, right? Right. So, you know, starting out, I lived in New York and it was like, oh, there's all this cool stuff to do and I can't do any of it. 2020, I would say 2019, 2020 is when I kind of started to round that curve of like, oh, good, I can like do yeah. stuff. And then we were locked down and for everything was closed. Yeah. So there's definitely some revenge spending. It's Broadway back. Here. It's back. Right? Oh, yeah. Big way. I mean, the theaters are packed. You walk out you after don't have to a wear show. Masks in there. Yeah, you, you do, do have to wear, you do masks. Have to wear masks. Oh, yeah. Still, okay. Wow. Yeah, I think through June I mean, maybe. Okay yeah. um, but no, I mean, it's the buzz. I mean, it's just it's really really cool. So I would say do Broadway shows. I did Hades Town. Oh, I did Springsteen. It? I did a bunch since the pandemic ended or mm-hmm. it didn't really end. Um, it's just great to be back in a theater. I'm not like a huge Broadway person, but I loved just being back in a theater yeah. and seeing people well, act. I, I love it too, like because I don't have talent, but yeah. I mean, I, yes, like, you I'm, do. yes, well, you do. I if we're not. I'm not going to sing, but like you know, it's like. Oh at no, home, I'm saying you have you're, talent. You're yeah, talent. I, yeah, I don't maybe not the, Broadway talent. Right. <laughs> okay, but it's either. just it's cool to be around that, and like you, even yeah. though it's not what I do, it's like you feel inspired after seeing like people. Perform. It's also so important for tourism. Yeah. Yeah, I I always find it amazing, like people like remembering these lines and these cues, like whether it's Broadway, whether it's yeah. like movies and stuff. I'm like, wow, like you got to remember yeah, all yeah. this. Oh, you know what I think is amazing. You have to do seven shows a week or whatever. Eight. Eight. Yeah. I would right, because there's a matinee. Lose my, yeah. I would lose my mind doing and, the same show eight times a week for six weeks. And they're so physical. Like, because mm. I'm into dance. Oh, and, yeah. like, so, oh, the, like, well, Moulin right. Rouge especially is a very physical show where yeah. I'm, like, that's a three hours dancing. you're on. Yeah, you're dancing, you're moving, you're doing jumps, you're running from this part of the stage to that side, you're singing your heart out. And, I mean, I know how I feel after, like, a 45-minute hit workout. Right. You know, like, I wonder if they do like you know the whole you know ice buckets and stuff. They do. Like, they do, right? Yeah, they, must, they like, like those kinds of things. Um, like what's it the cupping thing? Uh, you know, yeah. like all that weird. Well, one day someone we don't explain we that. don't talk about perverted stuff like that on, <laughs> on the show. What's the next hot show that's coming along, or what's the next thing on your list? That you um, do? so the one that's getting a lot of buzz this season is a strange loop. So I'll probably see that, and then I might have to take a pause for my budget after seeing. Who's in that? Um, so I'll be honest, I don't know big names, but the, it's just a great story of kind of like a marginalized person who wanted to be in Broadway creating a show. And it's just um, big on the Tony list, which I think Tony's are in two, It's three, a Broadway two, show about okay. Broadway shows? Yeah. Okay. I'm into it. Okay. You got a favorite for us? I got a favorite. Uh, you know, I've... Uh you know, I'm a hip hop kid. Uh, Did you so have fun today? I had a lot of fun today. We love having you. This was you. great. Man. We're gonna have you back. We'll do this again. What yeah. are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm working most of the day. All right, come here after. <laughs> uh, but uh, Pusha T's new album. Okay, uh, it's almost try. I'll, I could talk about that for two hours. I don't think Mike wants to sit there. Yeah, we can do that on Pusha, our own. Pusha T. Pusha T's Pusha new T. album. I'm a huge Pusha T fan. So um, am I. And I feel like he's, you know, he's Since a little too hardcore. So he's like, you know, underrated just because he's a little more hardcore. I mean, Kendrick's album was beautiful. As what's well, your but. What's your What's your favorite aspect of Pusha's new record? The vibes. I'm still listening. <laughs> to, I'm still listening to it. I, even I listened to it a couple times like yesterday because I, I I'm just catching up. I didn't get to listen. It's been out for like three four weeks, right? But yeah. um like, I, I just think, like, you know, he still tells a story. Like, it's not honestly a single story. but it's a story about cocaine. Right? Like, the mm-hmm. album, like, it, you know, so it's an album still, right? Like, you can, and just, like, like I like albums if it's well done. Mm-hmm. And you can just listen to it front, front to back. So I mean, half the record was produced by Pharrell. Yeah. And the other half by Kanye. 
and you could tell <laughs> which yeah. song is whose. Really? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. You could very much tell. He has Jay-Z on a track, which is, like, rare. Neck and wrist, yeah. yeah. Did he have Neil Young pop on? Neil Young does not appear uh, at all. <laughs> um, but he's kind of yeah, uh, Kanye, settled into a right. very specific role in hip-hop. Yeah. He's the Joker. He's, like, the villain that is smiling the whole time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of real, a lot of rappers are very afraid of him because he's, like, one of the real he's guys. Real. And he will. He can still talk about the stuff that he raps about. Like, and he know. will go after you, yeah. like, in a very pronounced way, as Drake learned. I think he's, <laughs> I think he's, I think he's rap needed a villain, and he's a great villain. He's great. So yeah. And uh, I mean, I've loved him since the clips, too. Co-signing co, co that, that uh, favorite. All right, we're going to get out of here. Duncan, are we announcing anything? Anything else that we have to get to? Yeah, Future Proof. Should we talk about Future Proof for one second? Probably. Do, do you know about this? Yeah, September 11th through the 14th. Look at you. Are you coming? Wow. Do you know about this? New the I'm, I'm just waiting to see, like, school schedules uh, and same. all that stuff. Yeah, right? I don't know if I can make it either. School? <laughs> kids' school. <laughs> Start. Not his schedule. Not with my kids' uh, <laughs> schedule and all. All right. Future Proof is the world's first and largest wealth festival. So it's not a conference. Yeah, it's not a conference. It's a if you call it a conference, we uh, deregister you. <laughs> but it's going to be the South by Southwest for wealth and finance. So we're expecting 3,000 attendees. It is outdoors, the entire thing. Huntington Beach, right? Joshua yeah. Tree. Uh, there are four hotels in the city of Huntington Beach, California. We rented them all out. Nice. So they're all taken. Yeah. So you can get a room there as part of our block. Uh, uh, Outcast is performing. I don't know if... I, I don't know if that. I know that's meaningful to anybody. Push a T. Uh, push a T. Uh, no push a T. Um, you got my boy Mick coming. Uh, Mick is coming. Who is like one of the most famous DJs in the world? He plays like. Awesome. I was with him like, last week at Permissionless. Oh, he played Permissionless. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Did he tear the place apart? We we had a good time. We, it was tequila and us behind the booth. Dude, not <laughs> not only is Mick DJing, but we're putting him on stage and talking about yeah. entrepreneurship. He's, He's great. got major sponsors. Amazing. Uh, global companies backing him. Yeah. Uh, Fitz and the Tantrums are playing. I know I'm spe spending a lot of time speaking about the music. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a festival. It's not a. It's not That's a conference. Fun. However, we were going to have uh, some really big names in financial advisory, wealth management, investing, fintech. We're going to litter the stage with uh, great speakers and performers, and it's going to be. Awesome. It's going to be dope. Who and covers that at Barron's? Uh, Jack Otter. You should, oh, switch with the, him. Yeah. you should switch with him. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wall Street will be – Goldman Sachs Asset Management oh, is a perfect. sponsor. Uh, who else is sponsoring? State Street. Everyone. everyone. Everybody. Yeah. We're, we're having some big podcasts there too. Dude, Duncan and John are going to be doing live podcast production for oh. some of the big shows. You should do That's a podcast awesome. from like the outside. You know how they do like we are. Super Bowl and stuff? Just sit yeah. outside at a round table. Will you, will you school him on what do we're that. doing? It's not going to be great for audio quality probably. But Shut yeah, up, so Duncan. You'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. <laughs> People don't realize the set you guys got here. We have the podcast stage. <laughs> And That's awesome. it's going to be video be and audio. in the background. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. It's, it's on the beach. Like, I'm not even joking yeah. around. It's literally on so the beach. So on the sand, like, you will have the podcast. Dude, that's it's so a good. half a mile of beachfront. We're calling it the boardwalk. That's and that's cool. that's where all the shoes, events are. So this is great. You will be barefoot. Sandals and seaweed. Sandals and seaweed. Last time I was hunting to beach was a wedding. And uh, virtual land. No, I'm kidding. All right. <laughs> uh, you guys are awesome. We had the best. Michael and I had the best this time. We're so glad that uh, we're so glad that we could uh, do a live show yeah. and having amazing guests to hang out with is like the whole point. So thank you guys for coming. Thank you, thank you yeah, for yeah. having us. Let's get. Let's just get tell listeners where they could follow you guys, and we'll and we'll uh, we'll exit. What's the best place to follow your stuff besides Barron's? Besides Barron's, so Twitter and Instagram handles are Carlton English. And when is your show on TV? My show is on Saturday mornings on Fox Business at 10 with a re-airing at 1130 and also on Sundays. Okay. Don't miss Carlton English. What is it called? Bar uh, Barron's Roundtable. Don't miss Carlton English on the Barron's Roundtable show. Okay. And you, are, I know your uh, stock twits handle. Yeah. Okay. My it stock twits and Twitter handle are the same. Okay. Arcana. R-K-H-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Okay, awesome. And what what time is your show on Fox Business? Uh, you know, I'm I'm right in between. The You're almost there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm working my way there. All right, thank you, thank you for coming, and thank you for all the great work you're doing at Stock Twits. We appreciate it. Thanks, man. Uh, and keep crushing it. All right, guys, we're gonna take you out of here. Make sure to like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. We'll see you next time. I'm waving. waving. I don't know where waving. <laughs> no, that'll that'll make it. Okay, perfect. That'll make it. I was like, which that way am I waving? Time. That might have been the first time.